You're listening to the Paul Cardall Podcast. Please show your support by subscribing along with leaving a review. Hello, I am Paul Cardall. Welcome to my podcast. My guest today has written a book called Sharing Jesus with Muslims, a step-by-step guide. He says, since the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, relationships between Christians and Muslims have been defined by fear. My wife was working on Wall Street in Manhattan on that horrible day. And, uh, you know, we could have a podcast alone of her experience and how horrific it was. So the increasing violence in the Middle East has caused Islam to be associated with persecution and terrorism and has led many Christians to view Muslims as the enemy. For the Christian, the Bible provides a clear instruction to move past fear and share the gospel with all people, according to my guest. Every Christian can be an ambassador of Christ to Muslims, even without becoming an expert on Islam. We will enjoy this conversation with Fouad Masri. This is the Paul Cardall Podcast. Good morning. How you been? You, since I saw you. Since good, I, good. <laughs> we did the book signing. Sunday we had uh, some more contacts with people from overseas. And then I got a call with somebody who has become a believer, uh, Iraqi background. He has become a believer in Christ for the last about eight years. Wow. And he's sharing with another Sunni Muslim, another friend of his, about the uniqueness of Christ, how do you get salvation, and this is the month of Ramadan, so a lot of Muslims are thinking about religion, about God, about eternity. It's interesting, you know, you grow up with that lens, the Christian lens, and then there's those that have never been exposed, obviously, to Christianity, the same way that Christians have never been exposed to Islam. And so there's all these preconceived notions, you talk about it in your book, There seems to be this fear towards one another and uh, basically get to the heart of the book, sharing Jesus with Muslims. But I think in order to do that, give us a quick background, you know, being born in Lebanon and here you are in Nashville, Tennessee today. Uh, I like Nashville. It reminds me of uh, growing up in Beirut, Lebanon. They don't have a sea or an ocean, but uh, the mountains are very much like the Lebanese mountains, rolling hills. I grew up three blocks from the city, I would walk to the beach. And Lebanon is a small country. Uh, if our audience is from the United States, it's the size of Connecticut. It's not a very big country. I can drive from Beirut, Lebanon to Damascus, Syria in an hour and a half. Uh, but just briefly about the growing up in Lebanon, I um, grew up during the Civil War. And the Civil War kind of awakened in my heart that we have a problem today. Uh, people, people used to think politics will solve everything. And I used to believe that. And it didn't solve anything in Lebanon. Uh, People thought, you know, somehow if we tell people not to shoot each other, they will stop shooting each other. And that's not the case. At least I was growing up. I was in my early teens. And I'm thinking to myself, why people still kill each other? Why can't they stop? And uh, the gospel message had come to our family because my grandfather ran away from the Ottoman Turks and went through Ellis Island to Toledo, Ohio, where he heard the gospel. He became a believer. He decided to become a pastor. He died in Syria. I don't know him, never met him, uh, but he brought the gospel to our family. So there was a gospel message in our family. But during the war, I thought, you know, hey, this is there is no God. If God really exists, he's not a good God. I don't want to believe in him. I don't want to follow him. My best friend, Walid, died at age 18, uh, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. He was killed by the uh, Muslim militia, uh, the PLO, the Palestinians. So as a Lebanese, I hated them for killing my friend. Going there, you hear that Israelis and the Jewish people are your enemies. So I'm a young man growing up in that uh, uh, in that zone of war and murder and hate. And you know, you start picking people by religion, by politics, by culture, ethnicity. You know, we had Iranians, we had Iraqis. So uh, my heart was filled with hate and kind of uh, racism to others. Uh, through that, I decided to study different religions because I thought, well, you know, I heard about Jesus. So I'd studying different religions, and it struck me that as I compare them to Scripture, to the Bible, Christ was different. So give you a quick example. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, everybody likes that until you think 
love them as myself. Like, you know, there's a cost here. So we're living in Lebanon. You know, that was a problem. They were not really loving their neighbor. The second Jesus uh, thing he said that's powerful, our Savior said, love your enemies. Do not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with good. Well, that was hard. I mean, in Lebanon, the, the, in the war, they said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And so, you know, people were killing each other, trying to get revenge. I myself had hate. How can I pray for the Israelis? How can I pray for the Palestinians? How can I do that? There's so much hate in my heart. So Christ's words were speaking. The second thing that Christ spoke to me is when Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what the master is doing. I call you friends. And in the Greek, it's very clear. It says, I'll call you best friends or beloved friends because I've told you everything from my father. And that struck me. All religions, all religions says, try, try. Uh, God is the master. God is the king. Christ is saying, no, God is your heavenly father. God is your loving uh, friend. God wants to, you to be in his family. It was a different understanding. And I am and I read the Mahabharata. I did uh, study. I, I read uh, part of the Vedas. I, I looked into uh, the Krishna, the Hare Krishna. I looked into Buddhism, uh, Torah for sure, the Jewish religion, and then Islam. I did the Quran now more than... 40 times in Arabic. And so the struggle for me is Christ was different and he is asking change based on coming to him, following him. Uh, all religious texts will give you a rule. The only thing about the Bible which is different is that the whole text is about the person of God and that God has come to us. So uh, to make this uh, quick, because I know our listeners might like to know the conclusion, is a situation happened to our friends who died in a bombing. The guy lost his wife and three kids. He survived. And that was the trigger. I went to my room. I knelt by my bed. And this is how I prayed. I said, God, thank you for sending Jesus. Forgive me because I hate Jewish people and I hate Palestinians. Forgive me that I'm living my life away from you. I want to follow Jesus until I day I die. You forgive my sins and change me. And Paul, this is what is our message. I'm speaking from experience. God changed my heart. I started praying for the Jewish people. I started praying for the Palestinians. I started praying for the Iranians. I started seeing people are God as God's creation. And when I share with someone about Christ, I'm not sharing because it sounds good or, you know, this is an idea that I like. No, no, God changed my heart. Jesus did something different in my heart. And I've seen him do something different in other people's lives. So when we are inviting people today, whether they're Muslim or not, we're inviting them to meet the Savior, the Messiah, the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus who, who is ready to take him into his family and invite them to the greatest uh, relationship ever. It's amazing. For Americans, when we think of Lebanon, we're thinking Islam. We're not thinking that there are Christians, at least for those that do the research and know, that there are Christians in Lebanon, and there are Christians spread throughout the entire Middle East, uh, Afghanistan, everywhere. And there's pockets of these communities, but there's also, I think you had a statistic on your website, uh, that there are 1.8 billion followers of Islam, but and 4 million in the United States, but 50% have never been associated or know or are familiar with Christianity. And for Christians here that are listening, we also have Muslims that listen to this. For Christians that are listening that may not fully understand Islam because the media has kind of defined what mm -hmm. it is with all the fear and, and, and it's associated with terrorism. Can you can you break down Islam? Because I, I know there's so many different varieties and most people assume it's just one group. And then you got like the Taliban and all these ultra orthodox yeah. fundamentalists. So part of the reason we I started a ministry Christian project and a major reason why I wrote the book Sharing Jesus is uh, today we have a lack of understanding of each other. And part of the problem is we do not uh, hear the message. So it's easy for somebody to tell me, oh, all Muslims are terrorists. Well, that's not true. Now, yeah, the jihadis are Muslim. True, that is a problem. 
but not all Muslims are jihadis. The flip side, today Islam does not teach Christianity correctly. So they teach in the mosque, they teach you that most Christians worship three gods. Well, that's not true. We worship one God. Uh, the other teaching that's false is they teach them that Jesus is called the Son of God because we Christians believe that there was a sexual act. Well, that's an insult to two billion Christians. We don't believe that. We believe it's a miracle birth, which is mentioned in the Quran, by the way. So the Islam brought it from, you know, borrowed it from Christianity. So the the, the struggle is they no look at us as false religion. The other thing that is a problem, Hollywood and the media, their goal is to make money through entertainment. But many Muslims today have never met a Christian. They've never read the Bible. Even the Bible is illegal in many Muslim countries. It's illegal in Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen. So many times Muslims don't know what we believe. They collect the information maybe from a movie they watched or, you know, they saw maybe a picture of the Pope with, with, an, with an imam. So there's inform, the information is, is missing. It's like there's static. There's, there's distractions. Now you add to it politics, you add to it terrorism, you know, and that's just, so since September 11, it's a huge issue. The Muslims don't understand the Christians, the Christians don't understand the Muslims, and Christians tend to be nice, they don't want to offend anybody, so what happens is we don't share, we don't talk. It, so it adds to the uh, uh, is, uh, the myth that Christians are mean or false. I was in a train ride from Casablanca to Marrakesh. And the gentleman said to me, uh, where do you live? I said, in the United States of America. He goes, oh, Americans are ignorant and a bunch of cow herders. And I said, have you been to America? He goes, no. I said, how do you get this information? He goes, uh, uh, I watch movies and I watch television. So his window, his window was in the movies, the television. And I said to him, sir, there are more than 3,000 mosques in America. He goes, really? America allows Islam? I said, yeah, we have freedom of religion. He goes, it's illegal to build a church and be a Christian in Morocco. You cannot be a Muslim who becomes a Christian. You cannot be baptized. And so this is the 21st century, and there are countries that does do this. So it's banned. So there's this a problem, which I, I call it a crisis of information. They don't know. And the next thing is the crisis is with so much fear in our heart that we don't reach out. So what is, in a nutshell, Islam came because uh, Muhammad, who was born in Arabia, was fed up with paganism. And he felt that the Jewish faith and the Christian faith have a better message. So his first message was, we need to worship one God, no idols. And we have to be merciful to each other, which was message already been taught by the Christians. And then he, he said that not only we have to destroy the idols, but he said life should be about praising God. And we use the word hamd. Hamd means to be grateful to praise God. So these thoughts were great. And when you study Islamic history, you find that the first part of Muhammad's life in Mecca was very pro-Jewish, pro-Christian. Everybody was, were living together. When he moved to Medina, some of the pagan tribes converted to Islam. And in Medina, there's a shift. That happened 622 AD. And the shift, Islam becomes more of a political structure. So at the core of Islam, is a political structure. God gives you a leader, you follow the leader. And throughout Islamic history, there have been conflict who is the leader. See, this is something why I decided to follow Jesus. On Friday, when Christ died and was buried, the small band of disciples dispersed. Everything was over. Sunday morning, Christ rose from the dead. And the, what we call the church, the community of Jesus started. It hasn't stopped. It cannot be stopped because the leader is still alive. In Islam, we have a problem. Muhammad died. He was the leader. Who takes over? That's why there's been conflict. So it split Sunni Shia, and then the Shia have branches, and the Sunnis have branches. So right now, if you add the Sufi Tariqat, you have at least 200 different denominations of Islam. Now, the terrorist groups that we started seeing after September 11, they go back to something very important, and that will help our listeners. They want to live like the days of Muhammad. The best days in their mind are the days of Muhammad. So Muhammad lived fighting the pagans, fighting uh, other tribes, making Jewish and Christians pay jizya if they want to live under Muslim communities or any Muslim community. So the, the issue now 
they are coming up. It doesn't matter if they are Al-Qaeda or Abu Haram. doesn't matter. They're going to still come up because the best days of Islam are the, the days of Muhammad. So they want to go back. That's what we use words like usuliyin, the concept of fundamentalist. The idea is we want to go back to our roots. With the Christian faith is forward looking because Jesus told us something very important. I am leaving you now, right? He said this because I'm preparing a place for you and then I'll kind of come back. So for us, we always look forward. What is happening tomorrow? How today God is going to use us. And the book highlights the idea that we have a role as followers of Christ in our community, in our history. So when I meet a Muslim, my number one priority is to build bridges. We want to build bridges, not walls. Let me ask you a question. I I took some theological classes and seminary classes in in the faith that I grew up, which was Latter-day Saint. And, And the question was asked, you know, there are so many pagan gods that God may have used Muhammad and Islam to break down paganism. What's your thought on that? Um, God is sovereign. God is on the throne. God is powerful. Absolutely. The coming of Muhammad in Arabia was helpful to get rid of the idols. The other thing, most Muslims don't read the Quran. Majority of Muslims today are non-Arabs. They're Pakistanis, they're Punjabis, Pashto, Indonesian, Malay. They don't know Arabic or Senegalese. They don't, they don't read the Quran in Arabic. They maybe heard it chanted, they don't read it. So many Muslims don't know what the Quran says. So many of the Quranic verses are very pro-Bible. Even Jesus in the Quran is elevated among all prophets. He is called Kalimatullah, the word of God. You know, Now in Islam, they elevate Muhammad and respect Jesus. But the Quran elevates Jesus and respects Muhammad. He says the Quran, the book of Islam, which was collected later, basically after the death of Muhammad. But regardless, Jesus is mentioned by name more than Muhammad is mentioned. And there are 93 Quranic verses just on who is Jesus. He's born of the Virgin Mary. He, he does miracles. He raises the dead. He is called Kalimatullah, the word of God. He is uh, sinless from birth. Uh, he was going to be one of the judges on the end times. Uh, and uh, there's two verses that they do not like to uh, interpret correctly in Islam because two verses say that Jesus died and is coming back again. Oh, so I was talking to the imam in Albuquerque, Mexico, New Mexico. And I said to him, is Jesus coming back? He goes, oh, yeah, he's coming back. I said, uh, would you like to read the Injil? Would you like to read the Bible to be ready to meet Jesus since he's going to come back? And he looks at me and goes, oh, you're a smart man. Yeah, I like the Bible. I gave him Bible and, and, and uh, the Holy Testament in Arabic and because uh, he can read Arabic. And the funny part in that conversation is I wasn't attacking Muhammad. I was not attacking Islam. I was not attacking, uh, you know, the Middle East or whatever. I was just talking about who is Jesus. And from the conversation, you can bring it to the uniqueness of Christ. So, yes, the Quran speaks highly of Jesus. Uh, there are some verses we disagree on, absolutely, but there are a lot of verses we agree. I recommend that every Christian reads the Quran once. You can download it free. I recommend you read it backward because the shorter chapters on the back, you feel like you finish more. Uh, but then I ask um, Muslims to read the Injil once, read the New Testament once. Why not? Why not? We read their book and they read our book. What's wrong with that? Let's build Let's build bridges. And you find that many times Christians in our ministry, they call, say, Fahad, I just the more I read the Quran, the more I felt I want to share the gospel with my Muslim friends because the basis of the Quran is Allah is the master and we are the slaves. You are attaining your salvation. While the basis of the gospel, we start our prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, and holy, holy is your name. And so this is, this is a very important distinction between the Quran and the Bible. So is it true that, you know, obviously in Christianity, we believe we need a savior, we, we need atonement, we need redemption. But in Islam, the idea that God needs some type of atonement or needs to die or sacrifice, that's just, they believe that God's love and God's power is more powerful than that, that thought which appeals to a lot of people because this idea that God is going to be weak, God is going to be, you know, tortured, it goes against kind of this whole idea of God being all-powerful, and yet Christians believe it's all-powerful, so it can get kind of confusing there. 
But Muslims do believe Jesus was virgin birth. He, they do believe he's, you know, he is what he was, except the the atonement and uh, that he is uh, literally God. I mean, yeah. that's it. That's yeah, the issue, the biggest issue with Jesus is the atonement and the divinity of Christ. Okay. The, the divinity of Jesus is a problem. And, and thanks for Paul for bringing that up because... Many times we think this is new. It's not. That was the problem with the Pharisees. That was the problem with the Jewish leaders. They're thinking, what are you talking about? You mean the table of God is going to welcome people from the east and the west and the north? So this is not a new problem. Even Islam teaches that if you're a Muslim, you're superior culture than any other. So this idea of superiority has been there like any other religion. So the problem for us today is most people, when we talk about Jesus, they think religion. What do I do? What is the structure? What is the system? No, no, no. Christ broke all that. It, 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 John 15 is a powerful text because Christ gives a small image. I am the vine. You are the branches. The branch is supposed to do what? To give fruit. But Jesus doesn't command the branch to bring fruit. He says, you are the branches. Abide in me. Then you will bear fruit. See, this is, this is why I'm a follower of Christ because it's a I am not follower of Christ because I want to go to church on Sunday or I want to fast Lent, you know? No, no, no. That's a totally different conversation. So when it comes to the atonement, this is the issue that uh, I will come to the divinity in a minute. But in the book, we deal with the atonement. The reason we need atonement, because the work system doesn't work. In Islam, they teach you there's a scale. You God will put the good works on one side. The bad works on the other side. And I was speaking at Wayne State University, and this sweet Indian Muslim engineer, he goes, you know, for odd life is a test. You can pass with 51%, 60%. I said, my brother, the Bible says we all failed. We all failed the test. Because if you break one of the commandments, you've broken all of them. You know, it, that's the power of the gospel is that we are all have a zero on this test. Now, most of the people who want to do work, work salvation, they can answer a few questions. One, are our physical works here enough to cover a sin that insulted the divine God? Can a human effort cover a divine act? It doesn't. We are humans. So like, like if I hate somebody or I kill somebody or I lie, and then what do I do? Do I go pay money to the masjid or to the church? What do I do? Like go on, on Friday? It doesn't, it doesn't equal. The second thing is, what if on Judgment Day, your good works and your bad works, uh, and bad works are equal? So if they are equal, what do you do? It is a problem. And I remember Muhammad, another MBA student, we had a great conversation at a Barnes & Noble, and I asked him, what happens if your works are 50-50, equal? So he thought a little bit, and he goes, well, my name is Muhammad. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, God loves Muhammad, the prophet. So he won't keep me in hell for too long. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So he started, and you notice that this seeping through Islam, that concept of purgatory, the concept of, you know, I'll go to hell a little bit, and then I'll, I'll come back to heaven. That That's not in the Quran, by the way. Everybody will be judged by their works. So one of the things about the atonement, the atonement is that no human can save another human, and no human is righteous enough. So God found a way out. Now, this is something our, our listeners might not know. Ramadan is the small feast. The great feast in Islam is called Adha, Qurbani. And Qurbani is buried, uh, borrowed from the Syriac Christians. Qurban means offering uh, or, uh, or uh, redemption. So the idea, uh, the big feast is 70 days after the end of Ramadan, Muslims will kill a sheep and feed the people around or the family. And you ask them why, and they say to remember that Abraham's son was exchanged with a sheep. See, that's the power of the gospel. God found a redeemer. Now, most people think, oh, this means I can sin as much as I want. No, that's where you have to look at scripture and find out that there was a redemption. And in John 15, we are abiding in Christ. Now, in the divinity of Christ, this is very powerful. There is a chapter in the book on this, on sharing Jesus, because the Quran calls Jesus Kalimatullah. The word of God. The big question that Islam cannot answer, or let me put it this way, they try to answer, and it's a struggle. Is there a difference between God and his word? Imam al-Ghazali in 1100, 
said that there is no difference. Because Imam Ghazali said, if we believe in Allah and his word, then there are two divine beings, then we are dualists, we are not monotheists. So his dissertation in the, in the Arabic book, al Munqidh Min Al-Dalal, the code is that Allah and his word are one, God's word is one. So for us, if Jesus is God's word here, then whatever Jesus says is exactly what God wants us to know. See, the, the incarnation is the power of the good news. Um, and this is in uh, the book of John, in the Bible, John 1, 1, and then in John 1, 14, yeah. tells you about the incarnation. Thanks for asking that question, because <laughs> the, the this is a core point that we need to discuss. Now, uh, for our listeners, God bless you, brothers and sisters listening. It's very important to share with these things in a loving way, in a welcoming way, not argumentative. You can, we can always try to win the argument, but that's that's not the goal. The goal is to help our Muslim friends understand our faith. If they want to join the faith, hallelujah, praise God. If not, it's okay. Our faith is open. Jesus invites people. We don't coerce people. And we will be right back. Friends, I'm excited to tell you about a new song I've made available. It's called Love One Another. It's part of an album that I'm going to be releasing this fall, and I want to get you some of these songs before the album comes out. So go to my website, paulcardall.com. All of the information is there, or you can just go to Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to your music and search Paul Cardall, Love One Another. invitation was you know it's always there he said come unto me all the labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest but this idea of working towards salvation i love the faith i grew up in and often as a child it would be in this form of christianity is if you do everything you can and then god will meet you halfway well that's a legalistic form of christianity where it contradicts what happened in the Bible, which is Jesus fulfilled the law. Now, in Islam, to my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, they do believe uh, they're descendants of Abraham. The Ishmaelites, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because Hagar, poor Hagar, uh, was a victim of, of Sarai. This is before God changed her name. She basically human trafficked her slave to Abraham, who then had a child, um, because Sarai was trying to force God's hand, which you can't do. But they repented. God uh, forgave them. And this is the beauty of Christ, forgave them and changed their hearts. They were born again. They were given new names. And then this covenant was made. It was reaffirmed, reaffirmed. And then it passes down through the generations. And for Christians, it comes through the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, everyone's pretty much knows about Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. And, uh, that story of, of the, the roots of Abraham being promised a Messiah. Well, in a lot of Christian churches that are restorationist churches, they believe they have to restore what was once, uh, pure. And so like Islam, it's it's similar and the beauty in what i've discovered is what is right there plain and clear in matthew when jesus says i have fulfilled the law which is completed the covenant and he is the new and everlasting covenant he is the temple that is promised to stop building temples he is the only high priest and and yet there's this confusion even in christianity about the fulfillment of that covenant. Yeah. And of course, when we get uh, our lives turned over to Christ, we make a covenant with him. And that covenant is between, you know, it continues, but it's not the Abrahamic covenant. It's a personal covenant. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on that with the confusion, even within Christian denominations? I became a believer, hallelujah, almost 40 years. And let me share with you for our listeners, you know, uh, some experiences I had. One of the struggles for me, I'm Lebanese, you know, <laughs> we have issues as Lebanese. 
is we don't know where we cannot play God. Today, there are many promises in the Bible, and God has a plan for the Jewish people, and God has a plan for every nation. That's why Christ gave a great commission. The great commission was, all authority has been given to me. That's how it starts. All authority has been given to me, where? In heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. I was growing up as a believer and thinking, wait a second, I would like this to happen. I'd like this to happen. Who's going to restore the temple? Who's this? No, no, Christ already told us. He's got the authority. He's got the timetable, not I. Uh, even last October, something happened. I was watching on the news. I'm like, Lord, what? when are you going to do this? And the Lord said to me, Father, you do your job. You do your job. I'll do my job. I, many times we want to play God and we split the church and we split people. When I meet a Muslim, I'm not thinking, oh, he's Muslim, I'm a Christian. You know, he's he's on one camp, I'm on the other camp. That's what everybody does. Look look how we're separating us. They're separating us by skin color and education and money. And how did one guy said to me, how did you vote last election? Come on, Jesus doesn't want to separate. Christ wants to bring people together. Absolutely, according to truth. But your question is so important because we spend so much time discussing things. One, we don't have the power. We're not gods. God is the God. Second, it's a timetable that he set, not we set. It's so uh, disheartening today in the 21st century that with all this technology, all this history, all the, the information we have, that humans are not becoming more humble. They're becoming more proudful. And, you know, they don't want to believe in God. They don't want to even obey God. Even, you know, uh, some churches want to change the text. One guy said to me, well, we want to take this verse out because, you know, really it doesn't fit our generation. You can't do that. You can't mock God. God is God. And I, I think today in the 21st century, we need to be more humble and seek God's power, God's salvation. God's change us. You can't tell people to do something if they don't have the power to do it. I mean, you can speak. You can say, I love your neighbor, love Muslims. You know, they just had an, a combating Islamophobia day. Okay. Well, great. How about combating jihad day? You know, it, it's, it's, you can't stop uh, people from acting according to their nature because their nature is hateful and evil. You got to bring something from outside that changes life. So your question is, when that's going to happen? I don't know. My job is to be an ambassador for Christ. One of the things I like to highlight is Philip was not a very learned man, but Philip knew that he had something to share. So he brought Nathaniel. Then he went to the Samaritans. But one of my favorite stories is when the Holy Spirit tells Philip, go down to Gaza. And as he's going there, he sees the Ethiopian treasurer. Now, you know, the Ethiopian treasurer, he's not traveling by himself. There is a carriage and there's guards and everything. And then the Holy Spirit says to, to Philip, walk closer. If you were just a average Jewish fisherman, and you're trying to approach the carriage of the treasurer of the empire. You could have been speared. You could have been cut your head off, you know. But he obeyed the Holy Spirit. And he approached it and he heard the man reading Isaiah. And it says, beautiful, he says, do you understand? See, one of the things the, the book pushes, and I want to highlight this. Last 30 years living in the U.S. and doing ministry across, the, across this planet, the church has, sit, has sat in the back seat and let someone else speak for us people who have no business representing the christian church the number one person that represents us is the person and the life of jesus christ and his teaching he is the one we want to talk about he's the one we want to put to the forefront people say oh did you hear what this guy said and what this guy said? i'm not inviting him to follow that person i'm inviting him to follow jesus and in the in the push today for us as followers of christ if you are listening and you follow christ my brother, my sister, they are neighbors who need to hear the message of Christ. They could be Muslim, great. If they're not Muslim, great. There are so many people, nominal Christians today, that need to understand the gospel. And so the push of the book is, let's be like Philip. 30 seconds of courage can change someone's life. Just 30 seconds, just say, good morning. How are you? Uh, how can I help? It could be a neighbor coming, moving, and you see that moving truck. You say, oh, I'm going to get them pizza tonight. Because they're probably busy moving. Or somebody, you know, comes and, you know, you have an accent like me. People say, you have an accent. Where are you from? Okay. Hey, you say, oh, yeah, it looked like you're the one born here. Oh, I'm 
I'm a refugee from Afghanistan. Oh, great. Welcome to America. How can we help you? Or there are people now on our in our ministry involved in Europe, in Africa, in Asia. Yeah, I just returned from India. These people are hurting. And Christ says a beautiful verse. Come to me all. Come to me all who are tired and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a, it's a messenger that's giving us a beautiful message. It's a savior that's delivering to us the greatest hope, that he is with us. He will solve the problem for us. He is the Prince of Peace. I want to read something. Amen. I want to read something that's in the introduction of this incredible book, and I'm, I'm halfway through it, and you just barely gave it to me. But in the introduction, you say, Muslims who manage to obtain a copy of the Injil or Bible and read it for themselves are ecstatic uh, to learn of its principles of justice, because they're big about justice. But grace and mercy, the concept of the equality of all people in the sight of God is refreshing to Muslim refugees escaping these sectarian wars. The Bible is clear that before God, we all need salvation, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, Sunni or Shiite, Arab or non-Arab. God loves all people. And it's fascinating to me how some believers, like we're talking about, it's interesting the way they have perceived Jesus and again, it goes back to Muslims not reading the Bible, so they don't know what it's about. And there's a vast, and, and how you say a lot of Muslims have never read the Quran. It's the same with Christians. A lot of yeah. Christians have never read the Bible. And so they believe a Jesus that is presented to them by a pastor. I think it's all misunderstanding. It's all about education. I want to talk about Gandhi for a minute because Gandhi create. I think Gandhi is an example of how to bring peace. We're going to say temporarily peace to a, a nation where there is a there is a power that is that they're tired of that's oppressing the people. They want to have freedom. They want to have grace. They want the ability to to do it. And he was a small, fragile man who would fast. And he was extremely controversial. Uh, you would agree with me. But he created a, a nation for a time. Then Martin Luther King Jr., if, if you go to the museum where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is buried, you'll see that he was obsessed with Gandhi and the Gandhi movement. And Martin Luther King was a nonviolent Christian. Yes. And yes. so why do we have a problem as Americans feeling like, and I, 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 I'm not a politician, I don't understand enough, but why do we feel the need to stockpile weapons to protect ourselves? Is it fear? Mm -hmm. What is it? Because these yeah. other countries have had great leaders that have been able to bring peace through nonviolence. One of the struggles that you're bringing up, very important, Paul, is the lack of knowledge. The people perish because they don't know the word. So you're right. There's fear. If I know the word, Psalm 91 are our own answers. Uh, the power of movies like uh, and uh, media like The Chosen is it's bringing up the word of God in something that we understand. So praise the Lord for that. And we're praying for more of this to happen because those who don't want to pick up a Bible and read it, you know, they were raised maybe in a Christian home. Maybe they did the prayer at some point, had a prayer of salvation at some point, but they're not getting deeper because we get distracted. So movies um, that bring out the Word of God, bring out these concepts that salvation is in the Savior, not in politics. I'm not saying not to protect our country. So please, we need to pray for our nation. If, uh, what I like about the believers, we have believers in, uh, in many Muslim countries, and they pray for their own leaders who are Muslim. They're not Christian, but we as believers are called to pray for our leaders, whether we agree with them or not. So you are absolutely correct. There's a lack of understanding the gospel. There is fear. The second thing that's happening today is we think somehow we can help Jesus out. People come to our ministry even. They think we're trying to help Jesus out. Christ is on the throne. The reason I am in this ministry and this work, because Jesus called me. The people who are involved with us, whether they're from any denomination, whether they're from America, is God is moving. So there's this a lack of understanding on the character of Jesus. Do I like the Constitution in the United States? I like it. It's beautiful. But you can tell me to love my neighbor. You can tell me we're all equal, but I might not treat them as equal. So the issue is not the rule, the law. The Ten Commandments are amazing. 
but people were breaking the Ten Commandments. So it's this idea of Christ is the power. So, and I like how you read in the beginning because uh, I, I can share a couple of stories. Just happened one story: a Sunni from Kurdistan was given a Bible, and he's reading it. And every few hours, he's calling on the cell phone to the person who gave it to him, and he's like, "Hey, did you know that Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount? Did you know that?" And then he hangs up, and you know, an hour later, or they get a text: "Did you know Jesus says this?" And this is the power of why we want them to hear the words. In Isaiah 55, it says, my word doesn't come void. It, it changes people. It doesn't matter your background. And what you're saying, yeah, maybe whatever you call these Christian nationalists, and they need to hear the words of Jesus. And some of them maybe consider themselves Christian. Okay, what does the Christian mean? Christian means Christ in the person or Christ showing through that person. So it's very important to come back to the text, to come back to the words. That's why I'm very big on asking Muslims to read the Bible and making on their decision. Uh, this uh, Islamic teacher, she taught Islam in Damascus, but she ran away from the war. She was a refugee in Lebanon. I met her in a Bible study. The reason she joined the Bible study, somebody gave her, they were giving rice and sugar bags, you know, they're refugees, and they gave her a in New Testament in Arabic, and she started reading Matthew 1, Matthew 2. She gets the Sermon on the Mount, and she said to me, Fuad, I taught Islam. I never read the Bible. And I was reading, and she's like, I don't know, but I love this Messiah. I want this Messiah. And and that's what I like about The Chosen. There have been other movies, but The, the Chosen series, the power of it is we look in the text. I know they do creative things around the text, but the text comes alive in a drama and it speaks louder than anything. That's why the word is, is important for us. The other thing I want to uh, make sure that people know is you don't have to get a PhD in Islam to share what you know about Jesus. Whether the person you're talking to is whatever, nationalist or Muslim background, Sunni, Shia, whether they're Hindus, uh, you know, uh, Gandhi is known to have said to the British, I want, I want your Jesus, but take your Christianity. I want your Christ, the take Christianity. And I've seen that movie. It's very good. And I was in January in his museum. He was a Gujarati. And uh, uh, I was in the museum of Gandhi. It's a wonderful to see how Christ impacted people who were educated. Gandhi was studied in the UK, in the United Kingdom, and came back and said, look, what's happened here is not right. But he took the Christ approach. Same with the civil rights movement. You know, thank God for a person like uh, Dr. King, because, you know, we could have all started shooting each other eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and never ended the, the war. Now it's ended. Yes, you can't change the heart, only Jesus can, but the society has changed in its understanding of how we live together. And the slave trades, even, the, the, the way that slave trade stopped was by godly men who loved Jesus, godly men and women who took a stand. I mean, it took forever for the Muslim world to even discuss that issue. Uh, it, it took them at least 14, 1,400 years, less than 1,400 years. Now they say slavery is banned, but we're not sure. But Islam allows slavery, and that's another problem you deal with. So bring people to the Word of God, these people who consider themselves nationalists and whatever. Say, hey, what does Jesus say about the stranger? What does Jesus say about working together? Christ says something very important, that he has come to reconcile us with God. We are supposed to be people of reconciliation, you know, not people of hate and killing. And so what is democracy? Democracy is to reconcile our differences for our common good. I, my bachelor's degree was in journalism and media. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened to American news, but you, you listen to the news and you get tired because you're really not getting the news. You're getting, you're getting the views, everybody's view. but you're not getting the real problem. And so, again, we go back to this, you and I, uh, us against them. And this is so sad, brother. And what you, what you brought up is the words changes the heart. Christ changes the heart. And we need to speak up. We cannot let someone else speak on our behalf. So uh, we have a, a big training coming here to Nashville called Sahara Challenge. It's all about reaching uh, Muslims. But our challenge for pastors uh, workers, teachers, and first responders, nurses. If you are a follower of Christ, you speak up for Jesus. 
Don't let someone else speak for us. It's uh, We don't want a movie to speak for us. Uh, we don't want somebody who's whatever invented something to speak for us. We have the words of Christ that speak for themselves. So many are abandoning Christ that were raised Christian. I know it's because they haven't read the Bible for themselves. They haven't read the words of God. They've been told how to how to live, how to be, and and that's what's so important. I I believe everybody at some point with their beliefs need to clear off the table completely. They need to clear the table off. They need to have no bias. They need to put the New Testament, you know, if you want to go back and read the Old Testament, but they need to put the New Testament on that table and begin reading. And we notice in J. Warner Wallace, who uh, is, you know, a well-respected author in Christianity, but he has a homicide detective and he was on, uh, we have a podcast episode with him, but he said, look, the four Gospels disagree on the details, but they all tell the same story. Jesus set it up so there are four accounts. Usually it's out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, but there's four that we have. And if you go in and you dive in and you read those four Gospels, you know, and then you continue on, you see a Christ that is the real Christ void of anything you've ever been taught you start to learn that relationship between you and him and i think it's so powerful for christians to read the scriptures because then they understand they know christ in such a powerful way that they are able to share with muslims now years ago you created crescent project and uh this is a ministry that educates. You mentioned you're coming to do a training here in Nashville, and I guess more than 400,000 Christ followers have been equipped, equipped through your ministry. Like, oh, that's almost half a million, which is mind blowing. So, kudos to you. Uh, tell us more about Crescent and if people want to come to a training or how they can get more information. They need to buy the book. I couldn't recommend this more, but uh, yeah, tell us about the Crescent project. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, the book has a lot of principles from the Bible that apply to even non-Muslims. We found out that's the case in our ministry. Um, I praise God to report that as of uh, uh, March 1st, we have broken 500,000 mobilized believers. Uh, we are now in 96 countries. So through all our activities, whether online, materials, resources, our finding is the following. The people who are say we're leaving Christianity, they really leaving the church structure, the church uh, establishment. In America, we've lived in a society that's free and open, so we haven't, we haven't been really persecuted like other countries. What we're seeing in other countries, we're seeing an increase in people following Jesus, not less. Um, I can report a lot on other countries that I'm not working in, but in 96 countries that we are in, we're seeing an increase of coming. Now, we haven't reached critical mass. But uh, the website is cphope.org or crescentproject.org or cphope.org. People can come. There's a ton of materials. There's QR codes. You can download things. Uh, also, the training is on how to begin a conversation and then how to see a movement of the Holy Spirit in your in the community. We call that Sahara Challenge. It's a very fresh program with up-to-date information. It's designed like TED Talks, like short messages. Uh, people who sign up can get more resources. But my challenge for us as believers is we need to get a revival in the church, that the church is prioritizing more the activities. So everybody thinks church is you go, you know, one hour, God forbid the pastor takes a longer one, a longer message. And then, you know, after that, we go to lunch and then we go home, watch something, sports or football or something. That is the way we designed it here in this country. But this is just because it fit our schedule. That is not what church is. Church is Acts 2.42. We come together. When you're overseas, I love church overseas because it's not one hour. It could be the whole day. They come, they fellowship, they bring their meals. And, and this is what you are seeing. Today, the new generation, I love Gen Z uh, and the students because what they're asking, we want truth. We don't want falsehood. We don't want acting. We don't want somebody on stage jumping and you know, making theatrics. What is the gospel? And I praise God because God will never lose a generation. Never. God will never lose a generation. That movie, uh, Jesus Revolution, 
it's it's been going on for years it just happened that we saw it in california but the jesus revolution keeps going and christ said the harvest is white but as a good farmer any any farmer listening knows that you don't harvest every field all the fields at the same time so god is moving my challenge for listeners god loves you has a wonderful plan for your life you matter to god my sister you matter my brother you matter god has created you in the womb and he has a wonderful plan for you to be sharing him with everybody especially if you meet a muslim person but thank you appreciate all your knowledge your information and everyone the book is sharing jesus with muslims go to fuad's website i will put all the information in the notes one last thing i want to say is that ephesians 4 is so critical to understanding the organization of christ and why we go to church i want to echo what you said church is a welding together of unlikely friends strangers under the lordship of jesus christ therefore church is meant to be a heavenly society utterly unique in the world a place where the rule of the prince of peace is realized imperfectly but truly and that is the beauty your high priest is jesus christ you go and you are shepherd in the community you want to get plugged in to fellowship and you know this is how we met we there was a fellowship of men and uh, you don't have to do it in the church structure but it was so beautiful so thank you Bud, I appreciate you and uh, excited to learn more about what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Great to be with you. All right. We'll see you soon. When we listen to someone's story and ideas, we build bridges to connect with others. When we allow ourselves to see someone else's point of view, it minimizes arguments and disagreements. Please subscribe to the Paul Cardall podcast wherever you listen. For more information, visit www.paulcardall.com dot com.